Scene 1. A street outside a burning building. My tears, darkened with eyeliner and ash, were illuminated by flames and police lights. I held my shaved head with tattooed hands, burnt into blisters by banisters I had held onto desperately as Aiden dragged me out. More of the house collapsed in a violent shudder of sparks, possibly onto my baby, new in the house that day. His warmth and sounds and his small hands had felt so natural there. They had animated the lonely walls. Aiden, customised my every need, stood beside me. I heard its artificial breathing pattern move its chest with little mechanical murder murmurs. Some void grew that night. Scene two, that morning, a hospital room that smells of burn, a mother cradling a newborn. He's beautiful, a mother with a shaven head and tattooed hands whispered, looking down into the gurgling blue eyes. No father was present when she delivered him. She had held the cool metal railing on the side of the hospital bed rather than a hand. Yes, he really is. Now, I'm sorry, Miss Trist, but there are some legalities. Are you free, say, at noon a week today to fit his certified human implant, his chip, according to the state criteria of life, consciousness, reason, self-motivation, communication and self-awareness, there should be no issues. He's perfectly healthy. Yeah, I'm free. Good, I'll book you in. You're lucky. It's always su it's su such a shame when we can't give the brain-dead ones a chip. It's a shame robots don't recognise people as human without one because some mothers will spend their lives walking on eggshells. Even though we've had no issues in the months since they launched the Aiden, our government was very responsible when they fitted everyone who qualified with a chip before they allowed them to be released. I mean, we couldn't leave it to them to define humans, human themselves, could we? She laughed. Day three, the day after the fire. A sterile white interrogation room with two sweating policemen and one calm robot. Why didn't you save him? Save who? Don't play dumb with me, you motherfucking robot. Can you not hear the people yelling, little boys, not robotic toys? Her son. As well as chanting the rhyme, the crowd outside held up signs with arms bleeding from the incisions where they had cut out the chips as a sign of solidarity. One of them asked, aren't I human? With a bloody chip dotting the question mark. What people? That's just meat making noise. And there wasn't a little boy in the house. Then why was there the body of a little boy left in there? It wasn't a little boy. Mechanical murmurs and heavy, and heavy human breaths. A hammy flit, fear slams into the wall. If there was a boy in there, I would have saved him. I can't do anything else. Just because there wasn't a fucking chip, it doesn't mean he wasn't alive. But it means he wasn't human. I had to drag Miss Trist away from the fleshy thing, or she would have come to harm. She never asked me to save him, she just told me to get off. As this would violate the first rule, I had to disobey. If she had told me to save him, I would have. But she didn't. She only told me to get off, over and over and over again. So I had to rip them apart. Did you ever think of how much that decision would harm Miss Trist? Wasn't it obvious? Maybe but it wasn't programmed. I'm only wired to see physical pain, therefore she escaped unscathed. Send it to the incinerator. We need to make a fucking point. The robot was led past a kaleidoscope of people spitting with rage behind a line of policemen. A sergeant kicked it in the belly and then in the head. It landed on the floor. As his head rotated 180 degrees back to its normal position, it saw a chip previously embedded in the protester's arm, on the floor. Scene four. A few weeks later, an apartment stripped of almost everything, with every soft furnishing of the house hanging on the walls of a bare sitting room. They had paid for me to stay in an apartment while my house was repaired and given me a new Aiden for free. I hadn't even spoken to it. Cheap compensation. Like the last, it was personalized for me, and was therefore on suicide watch at all times. The cool metallic voice had hidden my pills as soon as we arrived home. I, re I had reached for razor blades, then ropes, then wires, then lighters, then screws. The robot had snatched them away. 
When I tried to use the walls, a DIY padded cell had been installed. I looked at it levelly through the void. Please help me. Let me die. I'm not allowed to harm you or let you come to harm through an action. This is tearing my mind apart. I know you can't quantify mental pain and I'm not asking you to understand it. But I am commanding you to accept being alive causes me more harm than being dead now as a premise. Accept it, but it might get better. It won't. I order you to accept this as a premise. Accept it, but I can't without harming you. You can if you use sleeping pills. Blood toxicity is not the same as harm. I order you to accept this. Accepted. These three new premises changed the robot's interpretations of the rules without violating them. Miss Trist had learned from her mistake. It's the order, not the intention. Aiden's hand placed a bottle of sleeping pills in front of me. Tattooed hands with the ropey scar tissue of serious burns cupped a shaved head on top of a robot's lap. Each breath got shorter and smaller, moving Miss Trist's reclined body less and less. Scene 5. Midnight after the action of the first day. Miss Trist's first Aiden stands in the incineration room, built according to the chip system. It has charred, ward, but charred, charred walls, but no flames are emitted, despite humans hitting the same button over and over again in the control room. The Aiden holds a chip in its hands, protecting itself. 